Christ taught, you should feel very, very privileged that you can read a story that God Almighty himself spoke. You do realize that, don't you? That God Almighty himself in the form of a man articulated his story, communicated his story, and aren't you glad there had to be some people standing by on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to catch the story of the prodigal son? Hallelujah. Aren't you glad for that? You know the story well. I don't have to rehearse it again. We rehearsed it on last Sunday. But it's always amazed me the draw and the power that sin has on humanity. I think about what the Apostle Paul said that the thing that I don't want to do, that's the very thing I find myself doing. In other words, I don't want to be angry. I don't want to have attitude. But for some reason, I find myself angry and have an attitude. You fill in the blank, ma'am, sir. I don't know what your advice is. Could be jealousy, envy. Could be gambling, adultery. I don't, I don't know lust. I can tell you this, though. All, all sins are filtered through three strainers, money, lust, and power. Every problem on the world stage internationally and domestically are filtered through money, lust, power. What do you think our government's always fighting for? Power. The Republicans want power over the Democrats, and the Democrats want power over the Republicans, and all we ain't got time to get into all that. Sister Shannon read a story to me the other day, an illustration of mother using. I'm not going to use that same illustration. But in essence, a little bit of the world in you can live in the whole loaf. Can live in the whole loaf. How many of you know what leaven does? It spreads. It's a germ, basically, kind of, right? If I'm not mistaken, a, a good germ, but it spreads. I don't know what it is, but the world has the power to call deep inside of the fold, brother. Even though the shepherd's there, he has a way to lob the ways of the world over your head. I don't know how, but it seems appealing, don't it, for some reason. I don't know what it is. You want to watch TV shows you know you're not supposed to watch. I'm going to tell you right now, if I'm watching the show, I don't care if I'm at the movie theater. I don't care if I rented it on Amazon. If they take my Lord's name in vain, I don't care how that movie ends. I'm going to cut it off. Can I get a witness anyway? I don't care how it ends. I'm going to tell you right now, you're not going to take the Lord's name in, front, in vain in front of me. I'll call you down. I don't care if we, whether you're religious or not. We don't, we don't take the Lord's name in vain. We don't stand for people taking the Lord's name in vain. But have you ever wondered how the enemy can tempt you with exactly what you can be tempted with the most? It's almost like he can read your mind, but the devil don't have to read your mind. Jesus said inside of man is jealousy, envy, murder, blasphemy. Adultery. He don't have to read your mind. He already knows what's inside. All these things are innately born. That's why some of you have a hard time turning away from lust. That's why some of you have a hard time if somebody's got a better truck than you. Men are bad about that now. You get new rims, I get better rims. Ask, ask my brother, he tell you. A man, you get a boat big at me, I get a boat. You get a 50 horse, I get a 60 horse. You get a, I get a 70 horse. I don't know what it is. But the lure of the world is strong and powerful. And just a little bit of the world in you grows and it grows and it grows like a disease in us until it pulls us back. And what's bad is we know we're being pulled and somehow or another we like it as humans because the enemy knows how to appeal to our flesh. This is a perfect example of the prodigal son. In the house of safety, just like we preached on last Sunday morning, he had an unlimited source. This man, his father, his home, his family was a well-to-do, affluent family. He went out and squandered a million, a limited supply when he had millions. He had access to millions at home. Remember that? Just briefly, the father is what? What did we preach on last Sunday morning? The father's the source of what? Provision. A father multiplies. A father, through the power of creation, creates life through his seed, through his loins. He is one of provision.
creation. In other words, God described the Father as a source. When we leave the fold, ironically, we're leaving the source to live on a limited supply. And I'm going to tell you, when that limited supply gives out, we see the raw nature of sin, which is not revealed until you come to the end of yourself. It's kind of like a man was up on a mountain one time and, he, and a snake was up there and it was cold. You've heard this illustration a thousand times, Paula. It, it fits right here. And the snake said, give me a ride down to the bottom of the mountain. It's cold and I can't move. And the man said, but you're a, you're a snake. You're going to bite me. I promise I will not bite you. I promise you I will not bite you. If you just give me a, just please, just carry me. Put me in your pocket where it's warm and get me down to the bottom of the mountain. So the man concedes foolishly and he reaches his hand in his pocket to get the snake when he got warm and the snake bit him. And he said, I thought you said you wouldn't go bite me. He said, you knew I was a snake when you picked me up. <laughs> but the son, the Bible says, he enters into a place where his limited supply runs out. I've never understood the Christian that wants to leave the unlimited supply and live on a limited Source. Don't you want to live in an in a, in a unlimited source of power? Come on, somebody, give God a praise. So he goes into the hog pit. Let me tell you something. The hog pit never wants to release you. I don't know why, but Christian people, for some reason, like, like a dog, likes to return to his own vomit. You know, I thought about that scripture today. I was reading my, in my personal time. Sister Audrey, and I read that, and I said, a dog returns to his own vomit. Now, I got two dogs, and one of them's a really clean dog, but he's a dog. You know, my, my Frazier, he's a uh, uh, you don't know Reverend Rhonda very well when it comes to pets, but Reverend Rhonda don't like pets in the house and she don't like hair and all that. And I don't either, but <laughs> the hair part, I wasn't talking about that. She said, if you let me, I will take Frazier home today and put him in my house. Did she say that? She said, I will have Frazier, that boxer of yours, in my house. So I let him live there. I said, <laughs> But I watched him one day. He I'm trying to make nobody sick. He up chucked something one day, and about five minutes later, he ate it. And I said, I thought you were smarter than that. <laughs> and that scripture came to my mind where Peter said, a man returning to the world is like a dog returning to his own vomit. I thought about that, and I said, wait a minute. He, he up chucked that because it made him sick. He ate something vile and didn't agree with his stomach or his throat or whatever it was. And it made him nausea. And so in a spiritual sense, he upchucked the sin. But for some reason, that sin, disgusting and nasty, we're drawn to it for some reason. Aren't we? We're drawn to porn. We know it's nasty as human. I'm talking about as a human race now, not us in here per, per se. We're drawn to things that we know are nasty, and many of us have upchucked the ways of the world. And when you look at it, you say, man, that's nasty. But for some reason, we go back to it, and we ingest it again and again. And kind of like the, in, in the same scripture, Peter said that it's like a sow returning to the mire again. I grew up in the country, and we used to butcher whole hogs, and we'd scald them hogs, and Man, it looked like a game deep down. Anybody here ever scalded a hog before or seen one scalded? One of you? Two of you? Yeah, you down the country if you know what that means. Yeah, you take that old big, brother Phil, you take that old big hog, that big sow, and you put her in a big old cauldron of water, and what it does, it loosens up the hair. The water got me boiling now. And when you pull out about ten men, you start kicking all, man, you start kicking all the hair off of her and shaving it off as best as you can. But you can clean up a sow, wash her down, I've done it, wash her down with a water hose and, and clean her up and soon she turns around right back in the mud. <laughs> How many of you know mud's stinky? You, you can get stuck in your truck, unless it's a Ford, no, unless it's a Ford. I feel, I feel like something I just, X-ray vision is me uh, messing me up right behind my back. Is that too bad? <laughs> bow tie man, you know. He is a spokesperson for the bow tie company. Man. Anyway. But I don't care how strong your truck is. If you get in that black mud, 
It ain't gonna hardly come out. You know, unless you've got a Ford, you know. For some reason, the whole pen don't like to let us go. It's constantly trying to come back in our life. And I don't know what it is, but even though it's nasty and filthy and dirty, and it's always in the most detestable part of the yard, right? We know it's nasty, but for some reason it pulls us and pulls us. And this is where the prodigal son was. He left a house that was clean and holy and righteous and a place to where he had unlimited power and sore, a, a, a home of wealth. Now go to our scripture, Brother Tim. Now here we pick up the story again. And when he came to himself, the whole pen eventually will show itself for what it is and you're going to come to yourself. In the old days, we call it a come to Jesus meeting. <laughs> In the old days. See, we don't want to say that no more, right? Because that might offend somebody. You know, the, 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 how dare he even say that I could possibly have sin in my life, right? I mean, or our lives sometimes. He had a meeting with himself. And when he came to himself, he said, How many higher servants of my fathers have bread enough to eat and to spare? And I perish with hunger, 18. I will arise and go to my father again. It is the responsibility of the fallen to return to the father, not the father to come to you. Notice the father does not leave the home. He does not leave the compound. He does not try to find him. Instead, this is what he does, parents. He dispatches the Holy Spirit to find him. I don't know where he is, but I'm dispatching through prayer the Holy Spirit of God to find this hope. To find this mire, to find this monk, and raise my boy from the dead. It's not a coincidence, is it? That later in that scripture, the father says he was dead and now he's alive. Glory to where, where are you buried? You're buried in the ground. The Bible says he was in the whole pit with the muck and the mire, and the Holy Spirit raised him. And he said, I will go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Notice he don't try to make excuses. So many of us just try to make excuses. Well, you know, Reverend Ron, that's just how they talk in the movies now. There's a thing you can go to for your children, and it's called Plugged In. And you type the name of the movie on there. We type that, that new movie screen, the new one. We typed it in there, and it was like 30 F-bombs. 75 F-bombs. <laughs> 75 F-words. And I don't know how many GDs. I said, you couldn't, I'm telling you, I'll tell you, you couldn't get me in that place to watch that movie. Go to them and plug that movie into that site. And you be careful what you let your children watch. Because a little loving can leaven the whole love. Come on, somebody, I'm telling you. The whole pen is trying to get them. I'm telling I'm just gonna say, I'm just gonna say it in a country turn, try to hog time. <laughs> Notice he don't make no excuse. I believe he got out, Miss Kate. He was living in the whole pen, so that means he didn't have a home. I believe he comes to the father that's nasty with mud, with, with, with sow dung on him. I believe maybe, maybe the father can see him coming a long way because he can smell him. Maybe. I will arise and go to my father. Eventually you have to say, I will arise and I will return to my father. Come on, somebody. They say, I have sinned. Well, somebody made me. No, nobody make you sin. Let me tell you something, the devil cannot make you sin, but he can cohort you. The hog pen's powerful, ain't it, Miss Kay? I bet you, I bet you some of y'all ride by them old bars used to go to, you can hear that boom, 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 boom. And if you ain't careful, you'll be. Huh? 
I listened to one of these. I was flipping through the stations. Sometimes I'm on visitation, and the stations I like are kind of fade. And you go into another county, like if you're going to Dorchester County or something, you're on ministry doing something, and I'm going to preach at a funeral out of town or something, and, and you have to listen to another station. So I just happened to listen to about five minutes of this new country music. I said, are y'all nuts to listen to that, some of y'all? It's the same thing. It ain't changed since the 60s. My old lady left me. And now I'm going to go fishing by the pond where my granddaddy fished and his granddaddy fished and his granddaddy fished and we drank moonshine there together. And I'm just going to go back home and lay in my bed and, and look at the walls. That's real encouraging. Let me tell you what you need to be listening to. Come home to the Father. Come on, somebody. Come home to the Father. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy higher servants. I ain't got time to get in all that again. 20. We're now here we are. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran. Did you know, did you know back in Bible days, an affluent man didn't run? Did you know really even in the days times? An older gentleman, it's just, for some reason, it's not correct to run unless you see a snake. I don't know what it is, but I just don't like to run. And it ain't the two older run. You don't have the balance you used to have. Let me tell you something. The older gentlemen don't like to be embarrassed. Mm -mm. And he fell on his neck and kissed him. I believe he had to fall on his Oh, oh. Whew. Well, you really got into it that time. I think about the day I got saved all the time when the Lord picked me up. Literally, I was born, I was raised, born and raised on Lovar Road. Literally, that's the name of the road I was raised on in Oswego. I believe the Lord had to pick me up and say, well, I'm going to clean you up, Lord. Let me hold you off a little bit. Let me hold. I believe he kissed him all over his face. I believe he embraced it. You know what I teach my girls? I'm not saying my girls are perfect. Don't ever, don't ever think when I say stuff about my girls. I know they're sneaky. They're teenagers. Mm -hmm. They ain't sneaky as I was. I catch them. I bust them. I, I bust them. I bust them. I said, they, you, they're not, you could do 20 times worse than you, you ever thought. Probably 20 times worse than anybody in here. I, I don't know now. And somebody else said, I don't know. The father received me just like I was. He wants to receive you just like in your current condition. He wants to take you just like you are. Somebody better give God some praise there. I always tell, you know, I tell my girls, say, if you get mad at me one day when you get older and you leave, I said, there's nothing we can say to each other that can justify you marrying a man that will beat on you, be hungry, or be homeless. You come home. How about it, parent? You come home. You come home. And those of you that's got up and coming daughters, and those of you listening out there, Brother Ron, there's a lot of weddings outside this church. A lot of weddings, a lot of funerals. And I always tell them when they come, I said, this, I'm not, this, this is not my approval to marry you now. When you come in my, my home office or my church office, this is an interview. They look at me. He interviewed me. I said, yeah, I'm going to interview you. I said, man, I said, you think I'm going to hook this young lady to you and you could possibly beat on her and hurt her and her be hungry? I said, if I think that, I don't have to marry you now. Let me tell you, just because you're a member here, I don't have to marry off your children. Sorry, not sorry. I'm not going to marry off your daughter to some guy, some bum, that ain't going to feed her, that ain't going to take care of her. I'm a, I'm, we we go hook her up with somebody that's going to talk sweet to her and build her and go to church with her. Come on, somebody. I don't have to marry you because you're part of church now. So I am responsible to God for that union. Let me keep on. Let me, let me, let me keep going because I probably hope I didn't lose no members there. I'm just, I'm just messing with you. You should want that out of your preacher. You should want that out of me. 21. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven in thy sight, and I no more will be called thy son. 22. Now here, here's where we really want to get at. He leaves the source. He leaves the provision. He goes out and he squanders. And he comes home. The father has a brow beating. Let me tell you.
tell you something, when members that have been away, they come back home, don't you, don't you dare open your mouth. You welcome them. You love them. This is what it's supposed to be, home with the Father. Come on, somebody help me out there. Look at, this is profound. The son says, I'm no longer worthy to be called thy son. Make me as a higher servant. If I can just be hired for the day and make one penny today, I sold my father's face. I sold my father's house. Maybe I could get a glimpse of mother in the window. If I can just be home for one day, it's better. Now, ain't that some repentance? I wish, I wish Christian people would say that. If I could just be in God's house one day. If I can be in God's face one day. Come on, somebody. If I could be in parents' presence one more time, it's worth it. So I want you to notice the father. They don't, the father don't rehash where he's been. Notice no conversation about where he's been. Instead, but, go back to 21, Timmy. I want you to notice the, the flow of the jargon of the writer here. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. 22, quickly, quickly. But the father said to his servants, the servant, the son, wanted to become. Bring forth the best robe, not just any robe, but bring the very best robe. There can't be but one very best robe, the robe of the father himself. Come on, somebody. The best robe, right, Brother David, has to be the father's. It can't be a servant's. It can't be a son. The best robe. In other words, the one I wear when dignitaries come. The one that I wear when my highest esteemed guests come. Go get the best robe and put it on my boy. The, what, what's, what, what's, what's the deal with the robe? You ever ask yourself that? Uh, some of you can kind of understand the rings, maybe the shoes. But what's the deal with the robe? The robe was a sign of favor and blessing. Whoever put the best robe now. I ain't talking about the one that was in the dry cleaners for. I'm talking about the good robe, the best robe. It represents wealth. It represents favor. It represents blessing. When we return to the Father, He don't give you seconds and thirds. He clothes you with the best. Yeah. 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 Wow, this, this is what the Father was saying. Now, don't you know the whole pen was calling him the whole time? Remember me, old buddy? Remember me? Remember me? This is what the Father was doing. I'm going to shield you from the power of the hog pen. In other words, per, turn your back to the hog pen and put off a line of brokenness and put on a line of blessedness. Put off a life of disease and famine and sickness and put on the robe of blessing. Put on the robe of wealth and affluency. Come on, somebody. Let me tell you what the robe did. When a guest came over, you wore the robe through town and let everybody know who you belonged to, that you were a person of importance. I believe the Father was saying this, though you were dead, now you're alive, you're important again because you're back with the Father, you're home with the Father, you're in a place of safety. Even more striking. Even more striking. He didn't even clean him up. He was muddy. Maybe I'm just saying, I'm just speculating. It don't, it don't really say, so I can, you can say he cleaned him up, that's fine, but I say, I say he put it on just like he was. It don't say he had time to go clean up, does it? So glory to God, the Bible says he had the robe put on. Let me tell you, who wore a robe in the Bible? Priest. It was called the ephod. Jesus is described as a priest. First Peter says we are priests and kings, did he not? So what's the robe represent? Righteousness. Oh, Miss Audrey, you ready? What the, what the father was doing is he was covering up his sin. He was covering up his nastiness. 
covering up his guilt. Wasn't that good? He was covering up his shame. He was covering up his backsliddenness. He was covering up the mire and the muck. I don't want nobody seeing my boy messy. Somebody bring the best robe on. We're going we're gonna to cover his shame. We're going to cover his nakedness. We're going to cover his brokenness. We're going to bring him to my boy. Again, my boy is home. He's alive. He's alive. Let's celebrate. Come on, somebody. You know, Joseph in the book of Genesis. I'm going to start closing up. Oh, i got to get through these last two, Brother Timmy, somehow. In the book of Genesis, does anybody remember how Joseph was identified? The coat of many colors. Whoever wore the coat of many colors was the heir. Whoever wore the coat of many colors, a robe. It was a robe. Every, all the other brothers knew. That's the favorite. Let me tell you something. You need to stick your tongue at the enemy this morning and say, I'm going to come home to the Father. He done put his robe on me, and now I got favor again. <laughs> Glory to God. I'm the favored son. Let me tell you something. The whole time you were in the hog pen, you were still favored. <laughs> Let me tell you again, you're only lost until you're found. He was restoring him. The first step to restoration is what? Repentance. Forgiveness. Hallelujah. The ring. He said, bring forth the best robe, put it on him, and put a ring on his finger. I want you to notice something interesting here, Miss Joe. He says, not the ring, not my ring, but a ring. It's not like a bubblegum ring, you know. I'm, I'm not saying I'm not saying he had a basket of rings and just pick one out and give it to him. I'm not saying that. Put a diamond and give him a ring. I'm not saying that. But there's a reason he said he put a ring. In other words, there were more sons, possibly daughters, other family. And when you put on the ring, it was a symbol of power. Come on, somebody. In the ancient world, a ring was not simply a matter of vanity. It was no mere item of excess wealth. A ring carries significance. Listen, I, I, I got to give this before I let you go. You ain't got to come back tonight. All right? So, when a baby was born, let's just say Easter, when the baby was born, the father put a ring on his little finger. And as, the, and as the baby grew, the ring was expanded by a goldsmith. And the, the bigger his finger got, the more they expanded the ring. That's what I'm trying to say. When he went through town on his bicycle, oh, that's so-and-so's boy. He got a swim. When I was growing up, they didn't sell swims in Walmart. I said, David, we, 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 we about the same age. They, did, they, didn't, they, did, they, didn't, they didn't have swims in Walmart, did they? You remember, you remember them swim predators? Boy, I wanted one of them things so bad. Back in, back in the 80s, it was like a $200 bicycle. I asked my mom for a swim predator one time. She said, you lost your mind. He's riding around the swim predator. And they look at that ring and somebody goes to bully him and they say, oh, don't touch that boy. That's so-and-so's boy. Come on, somebody. The Bible said he put a ring on his finger that my boy is home. We welcome him back to the family and now we're going to give him some affluency again. Somebody better give God some praise. Remember, I'm trying to hurry up. I'm trying to hurry up. I took too long in the beginning. I know, I know, I know, I know. So as the boy, and on the ring... It had the family crest on it. Now, you must understand, there are three things a ring does in those days. I promise you we're about to close. Don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. Don't give up on me. Don't give up on me. I know your mind's wondering. Some of y'all's ADHD and it's me. your medicine's wearing off. You're having a hard time. Hang on. I got scolded the other day by one of my seasoned salt members. Quit worrying about time, didn't she? She scolded me. So I preached a little extra today. It's her fault. Guilty party speaks. <laughs> yeah, 
I'm messing with Miss Donna. There's three people here I can't do nothing with. I know we're being recorded. Three people I can't do nothing with. Miss Donna, Barbara Gonzalez, and that thing sitting right there. Devin, you can't, you can't. You just do, just do like Tim and two man Taylor said. When they start fussing, just drop your head and just. You ain't got to hear what they say. Just, did I say that out loud? In Jesus' day, a, re a ring represented three things, authority, name, and access. Authority, name, and access. I don't know how y'all don't be taking notes. There ain't no way y'all can remember all this. There ain't no way y'all remember all this. Lazy rascal. He ain't gonna take no note. Authority. It had a crest on it. Right? Do you remember the story of Joseph? When he was second in command over all of Egypt? As a matter of fact, the Bible says, jo Pharaoh himself said, I'm only stronger than Joseph in the throne. In other words, if Pharaoh's in his chariot, Joseph's in his chariot, and they're riding along, everybody says, that, that, I see Joseph, but who's that other cat? That's what he was saying. Who's this other guy? The Bible says in the book of Genesis that Pharaoh put a ring on Joseph's finger. It's not a coincidence that Joseph gets a ring and Joseph gets a robe. Come on, somebody. Can I get a witness? It was a sign of authority. When you walked through town, when, when somebody looked at you, you, they could see that ring. They knew you were not a slave. They knew you didn't belong in the hog pen, and they knew that you belonged to a Jewish godly family. Come on, somebody. Somebody needs to put the ring in the enemy's face today and say, I've been restored today. I'm at the hog pen today. And when he approaches you and the hog pen tries to call you back to itself, back to the quack in the mire, then you show them the ring. Somebody just bowl your fist up right now and show the ring to the enemy. Yes, I sinned this past week, but I have been redeemed. I have been restored. And here's the proof to prove it. You ought to use that thing like a set of brass knuckle. Pow! In the 90s, when I was in school, we used to say, speak to the hand. No, you didn't. To me? Oh, she just, oh, she just dropped. Oh, somebody's showing me the hand back there. Girl, I'm not a spiritual mob. I put a hit on you. No biscuit for you today. That's the hit. Somebody ought to say, speak to the, look at that devil today and say, speak to the hand. Somebody give God some praise all over the building. <laughs> Number two, it represented name. When you wore the ring, you carried the name of the family. I bet you when he left home, I bet you he took the ring off, maybe put it in his finger, maybe his daddy took it. I don't know what happened to the ring. But I can promise you, he had that ring on. Somebody saw him in the hog pen. They would look at that ring and say, dude, your name is powerful. What you doing in the hog pen? You're supposed to be up there getting served. You're supposed to be living a life of blessing. Somebody give God some praise there as we close up. When this, listen, you, you, you don't understand the significance of the ring here. When the son left home, he gave up. He abandoned a family, he abandoned authority, he abandoned name, and he abandoned access. He abandoned the family, Chris. He abandoned the family name. No questions asked. As soon as he repented, as soon as he came home, the father put a ring on his hand. See, now you see this. Not ring is important here, but put a ring. See, the older son had a ring too. If he had daughters, they would have had a ring too. And it represents access. Hold on, hold on, don't give up on me yet. I promise we're closing. A, a ring in Bible days was like a credit card. You went to a store, I need oil, I need flour, I need olive oil, I need nuts, I need macadamia, whatever it is that you need, I need meat sticks. See where I'm going? Hot dog. So he would take a piece of paper and take melted wax and put on that piece of paper with the amount beside it, and the son or the daughter, whoever it was that had the ring, pressed the crest into the wax 
And he could charge anything he wanted. So it gave the son. Whoever had the ring had accessibility as a child to unlimited source, unlimited provision. The father said, you squandered what I gave you, but I'm going to overlook your mess. I'm going to overlook your, your disastrous ways, and I'm going to restore the family wealth to you. Go up to get you a new pair of shoes. Go up there and get you a new hat. Go up there and get you a new kango if you want one. Go up there. Maybe you want to go catfish and go get, go get you a couple of catfish commandos. Huh? When you return to the Father, you return to the access of unlimited source of the kingdom of heaven. Come on, somebody. Unlimited! And finally, the shoes. Come back to the instruments, Miss Donna. Instrument. Brother Mario, if you would, you can return if you want to. Miss Shannon said, I ain't going to fix it for like 35 minutes. Yeah. Y'all would get four, so I got at least five. Yeah. Y'all think I'm kidding. When I was in college, I had to do a, a, a different kind of religion class, and I went and seen Catholic priests preach 40 minutes. I don't know, don't know nobody here saying, pray my preacher long. Presbyterian church, Baptist preacher, yes. Methodist preacher, 40 minutes. Well, I don't know about the Baptist guy. I don't know. I don't know. I got lots of Baptist brethren. I'm just picking. I'm just, I'm just picking. I'm just good night, man. <laughs> he put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. How about our image again? Brother Tim, I like that image. See? In the accurate seat, it was like a little Sunday school picture, didn't it? Look, Mr. Donnie, ain't got no shoes on. Mm -hmm. the, the, the artist purposely showed his left hand. No ring. You don't have on no rope. In Bible days, when you took your shoes off, Especially somebody's house. It was a sign of mourning. It was a sign of mourning. It was a sign of weeping. It was a sign of a sign of wailing. And when Ezekiel's wife dies in the Old Testament, God says, "Do not weep. Do not take off your shoes." I don't got time to give you the scripture. Look at it. That's why you should be taking notes. You look at it when you get home. Then you'd be calling me in about three hours. What did you say about the shoes again? It was a normal practice to remove your shoes from your feet when you're mourning. For instance, I, we're not going to go there, Brother Tim. We're not going to go there. 2 Samuel 15.30. David takes off his shoes as he flees from Absalom. The passage reads, David went weeping and covered his head, walking barefoot. Walking barefoot. A sign of extreme mourning. But the returning of the son, he would not have to mourn no more. The father said, you don't have to mourn. You don't have to beg. You don't have to plead. Somebody put shoes on my Amen. boy's feet. It's a time of rejoicing, Amen. not a time of mourning. <laughs> Lord, I got so much more here. We're going to close it up right there, though. There was a custom in the Middle East. I don't know if they still do it or not. When everybody went into an unaffluent man's house, they took off their shoes, mm -hmm. and a servant washed their feet. But the man of the house, he didn't take off his shoes because he's already home. This is what Christ was trying to say about the prodigal son. Put shoes on the boy's feet because the boy's home. Amen. Come on, somebody. Maybe, maybe he did send a servant to wash his feet, but he said, my boy. And so in the end, he says, my boy was dead, and now he's alive. I believe he came home with a bunch of debt. He had to get home somehow. The ring. He put the ring on his finger. And he was able to pay off all of his debts. And then they killed the fatty calf. I 
think about his debt. Debt makes you feel like you're dead. Do y'all? It does me. Think about think about your house. Mortgage. Mm-hmm. Mortgage. <laughs> you ever thought about that? You do now, huh? You think about a house payment coming more. house you're going no oh, maybe I'll stay where I'm at <laughs> that's how you all that's how you look at some of you go to work ain't it get up on a, get up in the morning Monday morning where are you going to work when you coming home when they let me <laughs> how much you go get paid whatever they give me <laughs> how long you stayed again till they let me go I ain't time coming off when they let me off. <laughs> That's how it feels, don't it? You ever feel that way going to work? Oh, yes. I got the best job in the world. I'm going to tell you, I got it. This when I was fry. I was ready, boy. I said, I'm going to preach. I said, I'm going to break them up, build them up, break them down, build them back up, break them down, and build them up again. I believe you build up. My boy was dead. And I wonder if there's somebody in here today. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Can y'all play soft with me? Can y'all play soft? Mm-hmm. Pastor Ron, I'm just not where I'm supposed to be in my heart, and I'm just ashamed. Listen here. I don't care if you come to church every Sunday, you could not be right in your heart. I don't care if you come every Wednesday night, too. You could not be right in your heart. I mean, you come to every function, brotherhood, ladies, sisters of strength, meet. I mean, come to every and still be away in your heart. You say, Pastor Ron, I'm just embarrassed. I just don't have access like I used to. I'm telling you, if you repent and give your life back to Christ this morning, He'll put a robe on you, He'll cover your nakedness, He'll cover your shame, He'll cover your brokenness, He'll cover your embarrassment. You see, the Father's not about embarrassing you. Anybody wants to, can you come pray for like three minutes? Anybody that wants to, just for like three minutes. We don't want to get up out of our seat. His son arose from where he was at and returned to his father. Why do I have to come to the altar? He arose and came to his father. Anybody else in the building? You don't care who sees you. If I can just get back to the father's house. If I can just come home to the father with his safety, with his provision. Oh, 
home with the Father? Yes. I hope you do. I hope you do. Sister Barbara, I'm going to ask you to dismiss us in a word of prayer. Sister Barbara, and then when she's done, I look forward to fellowship with our youth tonight. We're going to have a lot of fun. And until I see you again, shalom, shalom. Sister Barbara.